Today, let us study the Word of God under the sermon titled, Let us discern between truth and falsehood. In our daily life in this world, human beings encounter tens of thousands of things around us. Among them, some are true and others are false. Even when we look at the news, we thought that in the past, the media would only report things that are 100% true. However, nowadays, we are finding out that there is something called fake news that appears frequently, spreading through the internet and other mass media. When it comes to the subject of faith, there is a truth and falsehood. This is why we need wisdom to discern between the truth and falsehood. In the Bible, King Solomon is described as a king of wisdom, isn't he? God granted Solomon the ability to discern between the truth and falsehood. It was his talent. Two women were living in the same house, and each gave birth to a child. One day, while sleeping, one of them lay on her own baby, and he died. So she put her dead son next to the other woman and took the other baby. When the other woman got up, the baby was dead. But when she looked at him carefully, it was not her son. So when she looked at the baby next to the first woman, it was her son. A mother can tell right away who her child is, no matter how young the child may be. Regarding this matter, two women went to King Solomon. This child is mine, but that woman put her dead baby next to me and took my baby as if he was her own. Please reveal the truth through a trial. They brought this case before the king. Nowadays, we can find who the true mother is through a DNA test. But this was a long time ago. In the days when they had no scientific method, finding the true mother was such a difficult task. At that time, many people were watching carefully how King Solomon will rule. According to the law in Israel in those days, when two parties claim ownership for the same object, and if the truth cannot be revealed, they had to divide the object and give half to one and half to the other. So according to the law, Solomon gave a ruling. This woman claims the baby is her son. That woman claims he is hers. King Solomon said, cut the baby in two and give half to one and half to the other. There is the wisdom of Solomon hidden in this ruling. King Solomon understood the true nature of mothers. He was confident that he would be able to tell who the true mother was. That's why he gave the order to cut the baby in half. In order to divide a baby in half, you have to kill the baby, right? Solomon is not this kind of a cruel king. Just as his name Solomon means peace, he was a king who loved peace and harmony and was never cruel or brutal. When a subject drew a sword to cut the baby in half, what did the true mother say? Oh, please, you don't have to give me the child, but just spare his life. What did the false mother say? Neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. The reactions of two women were completely different. At this, Solomon said, she is the true mother. The woman who pleaded for the baby's life, even if she cannot be given him, she is the true mother. Give the baby to that woman. 
Through the wisdom God granted, truth and falsehood were exposed. As for this age that we are living in, the Bible warned us that many false prophets and false Christ will appear and they would try to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's why we, too, should have the wisdom that Solomon received from God so that we can discern between the truth and falsehood in this age. If we do not have such wisdom, what would happen even to the elect? We may be deceived by various kinds of crafty schemes taking place around us. This is the situation concerning this age of the Holy Spirit. How unfortunate and pitiful would it be if we are deceived and let go of salvation right in front of the eternal kingdom of heaven. Solomon was not born with great wisdom, but who gave it to him? It was God who granted him wisdom. In the same way, we too should receive wisdom through the words of God so that we can defeat evil and uphold the holy and righteous will of God in all circumstances. Let's take a look at Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Let us acknowledge whom? The Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge Him, to know God. Only when we press on to know God will we be able to discern between the truth and falsehood. Since God is the one who always leads us to what is true, what do we call the Word of God? We call it the truth, don't we? In other words, the Word of God is the truth. If we always have God's Word in our heart, discerning whether we are living according to the Word or not, we would always be able to stand on the side of the truth. Let's continue with verse 3. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge Him. As surely as the sun rises, He will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Verse 6, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And desire what? Acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Am I being deceived by falsehood? It says that this kind of discernment only comes from knowing God. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to the earth and gave many lessons and teachings to his disciples. One day, he asked the disciples whether they knew and understood God correctly. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, it is written, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Instead of asking directly, did people recognize me correctly? He asked indirectly, who do people say I am? He asked the disciples how much they understood about Jesus Christ. Verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Verse 14, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Does it sound like people understood Jesus correctly? People of the world didn't understand Jesus correctly. Did they not give the right answer? That's why Jesus asked the disciples in verse 15, But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? He asked, Who do you believe I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Regarding the Son of God, it is written in Isaiah chapter 9, 
a son is given, and the son is mighty God and everlasting Father. In other words, Peter meant that Jesus was God. He answered, You are God. Verse 17. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. People gave all wrong answers. Some said Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And others said Elijah. There were many different answers. But among the disciples, Jesus acknowledged Peter's answer as the correct answer. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Most people thought Jesus was just the son of Joseph, a carpenter in Nazareth, and the son of Mary. But when he asked, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed are you, though most others didn't understand correctly, but you understood correctly. So I will reward you with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And on this rock, I will build my church. After hearing Peter's answer, Jesus gave abundant grace and blessings to Peter. This does not only pertain to the age of the Son. Even in this last age of the Holy Spirit, though many people regarded our God only as a kind neighbor or a gentleman passing by, if we are able to profess our faith saying, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, what will God say? Blessed are you. You are truly blessed. We have to know God. Only if we know God correctly will we be able to discern between the truth and falsehood. When we understand the characteristics and the nature of God, we will be able to discern between the truth and falsehood. Even if thousands of false Christ and false prophets appear before us, the guidepost of our faith is God. When we practice our faith, moving forward towards God, we will all be given the same blessing as that of Peter, who received the keys of the kingdom of heaven, won't we? Then, as we are trying to understand God correctly, what is the guidepost that we need to look for? Is this some kind of miracle? Or should we look for someone who does many good deeds for the poor? Is that how we can recognize God? Through what can we tell if it is God or not? All the answers can be found in the Word of God. Let's take a look at John chapter 5, verse 39. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. The Bible consists of words that testify about God. The 66 books of the Bible contain the records of the history of kings. In the book of Psalms, Poems giving praise to God can be found as well. When we look at the book of Genesis, it seems like a book of parables and stories. When we read Revelation and Daniel, they seem like books containing prophecies. The Bible contains various contents. But who do they all testify about? To make us understand and realize who God is, God granted this Bible to us. 
originally. We were princes and princesses of the kingdom of heaven. We live happily with God the Father and God the Mother. But we were deceived by the morning star, son of the dawn, or Satan, to commit grievous sins. Because of our sins, we were cast down to this earth. During the days of our short lives on the earth, thankfully, God granted us an opportunity to repent of the sins that we committed in heaven. In order to restore us to the kingdom of heaven, after letting us repent completely, God has allowed us to live in this world temporarily. Since we lack understanding in this matter, God Himself came to this earth. But we did not recognize Him correctly. Some said He was one of the teachers. Some said He was a prophet like Jeremiah. Some said He was a prophet like Elijah. When people had this kind of understanding, Peter answered, You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. By this he meant, you are God. Peter was able to give the most accurate answer to Jesus. Nowadays in this age, the world is full of many false Christ, false teachings, and false organizations, and religious leaders who are exploiting people under the pretense of God. Then, how can we recognize Christ? It is through the testimonies of the Bible. According to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, though people perform miracles, if they are not testified in the Bible, who are they? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Even if they did all that, what would Jesus Christ say to them? He would defeat them at the gate of heaven, saying, I never knew you. This is clearly recorded in Matthew chapter 7. Brothers and sisters, everything from Genesis to Revelation is a record about God. God did not spare numerous pages so that we may fully understand about God. We must know God. We should understand and receive God. Shouldn't we? Even though there is a large number of churches in the world today, we can discern between the truth and falsehood, starting with the subject about God's existence. It is not too much to say that there are two groups of people in this world, those who insist that there only exists God the Father, and others who believe that there exists God the Father and God the Mother. Just as Solomon was able to discern who the true mother was, we should discern between the true church and false churches, between true teachings and false teachings, and between the true God and false gods whom people have made up. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We believe in God the Creator, who made the heavens and the earth in the beginning, right? It is extremely important to note that in the original Bible written in Hebrew, God in Genesis chapter 1 is not recorded as singular. Nowadays, what do all churches believe? They believe that there is only one God, God the Father. If there is only one God, is it really necessary for Him to use the title Father? The title God is good enough for everyone to understand. However, another modifier, Father, is used together with the title God. It is because there exists another special being who should be clearly distinguished from God the Father. I believe there are some things that cannot be distinguished unless the word Father is used. This is why God added the modifier Father next to God. 
Don't you think so? If He is only one, He could have just said God. It is the same with human beings. We can simply say humans. But why do we use the expression men? It is because there is another being who should be distinguished from men, isn't it? This is why we use expressions like men and women. If there is one God, it is not necessary to add the modifier, Father, next to the word God. As it is written in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word God used in the Hebrew Bible is Elohim, which is a plural noun that means gods. This is extremely important, isn't it? We believe in God who created the heavens and the earth. We do not believe in a God made by men. We believe in God whom the Bible spoke about and whom God's words testified about. Then, as for our God who created everything in the beginning, we should check and confirm what kind of appearance God had Shouldn't we? In order to let us know about the existence of God, God created various systems on the earth. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. They serve at a sanctuary that is a what? A copy and shadow of what is in heaven. The Bible clearly teaches us that the reality is in heaven and what is on the earth is a copy and shadow. God has made it very easy for us to understand. In the family system on the earth, we have a human father. Then, there must be a father in heaven as well. What does the Bible say regarding this matter? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, it is written, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. The Father mentioned here is our spiritual Father, who gave birth to our spirits. It says, God, your Father knows. Just as there exists a Father in the earthly family, there is a Father in the heavenly family. We can see that there is a relationship of reality and copy. When we pay careful attention to all these things, we can clearly discern between the truth and falsehood in this age. If one attends a church blindly, believing in God, without knowing all this, the person may misunderstand that God is in any church he or she attends. We need to realize that this kind of thought is what is blocking the way to meet the true God. In the past, one member said, General Pastor, I was forced to become a grandfather. I asked, what do you mean? He said, when a grandchild was born, I automatically became a grandfather. In a household, there is a father. But clearly, there must be children who can call him father, right? Only when a man has a child, he can become a father. No matter how old he is, a man without a child can never be a father. Even in the spiritual world, there is God the Father, and there are his children who call him father. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Therefore, come out from them, and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a what? A father to you, and you'll be my what? My sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Here it is written, you'll be my sons and daughters. Just as there is a father, sons, and daughters, in an earthly family, in the spiritual world, there is God the Father. God the Father clearly testifies, saying, You be my sons and daughters. 
Isn't it clear that the earthly family is a copy and shadow of the heavenly family? Father on the earth and Father in heaven, sons and daughters on the earth and sons and daughters in heaven, they are perfectly matching. Then, even in this world, one person who is absolutely necessary in a family is a mother who plays the role of peacemaker in a household. There is an old saying in Korea, prosperity of a household depends on the virtue of the daughter-in-law brought into the family. Then, who holds the key to success of a family? Here, the daughter-in-law is to come into the household, give birth to children, and form a family. So it is said that a household can thrive when the mother stands firm. A mother plays a central role of a peacemaker in a household. She helps father and children to maintain good relationship with each other. She educates and raises children to become great individuals who can contribute to society. This is a role of mothers. Then, in an earthly family, isn't a mother a necessary component? If a mother exists on earth, which serves as a shadow, what can we understand about the world of reality? There must exist mother in heaven as well. But what do churches say? The church that believes in mother is strange. Their opinion is totally unbiblical. So what did Jesus say? Think about eternal life and look in the Bible. Jesus said that we should not listen to people, but look at the Bible. Jesus said, if we want to believe in God correctly, we should see what the Bible said about God. Since the Bible exists in order to testify about God, just as there is a Father on the earth, there is a Father in heaven. Just as there are children on the earth, there are children in heaven. And the Bible testifies that just as there is a mother on the earth, there exists a mother of our spirits. If someone ignores this evidence, he or she is rejecting the truth. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above, above here means in heaven. The Jerusalem that is in heaven is free. And who is she? She is our mother. Then Jerusalem, who is free, is which mother to us? She is the mother of our spirits, isn't she? Let's continue with verse 27. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman, who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. At a time the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. In every age, those who do the persecuting are born in the ordinary way, while those who are to be persecuted are born by the power of the Spirit. Verse 30. But what does the Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but who are we? Children of the free woman. According to verse 26, who is the free woman? Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. It is written very clearly here. So the earthly system and the heavenly system are related perfectly as shadow and reality. God created all things on the earth in order to teach us things of the spiritual world. He taught us the invisible world through the visible world, didn't He? When we look at Revelation chapter 4 or Romans chapter 1, it says that God created all systems on this earth in order to let us know about what is in heaven. Only when we acknowledge the existence of God the Mother, we can say that we are in the truth. Those who deny the truth of Mother belong to false prophets, false Christ, false doctrines, and false churches. That's why they can only learn what is false.
그런 정도의 어떤 가르침 밖에는 배울 수가 없더라는 것입니다. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 1 verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His internal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. His internal power and divine nature have been how? Have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. When God created everything, He made it so that we can clearly understand the invisible world. So that men are without what? Without excuse. God made it. So that no one could say, I couldn't believe because I didn't know. Among all the beasts of the field, plants, fish of the sea, and birds in the air, is there anything that is born without a mother? Then, why did God create mothers? God could have easily made it. So that several children can be born at a time without a mother, couldn't he? God can certainly do so, but he wanted to teach us his will through the providence of nature in which all life forms receive life through their mothers. There certainly exists your heavenly mother in the spiritual world. So believe in God the mother and be the children who can follow her wherever she goes. Father also explained, using a Korean proverb, so that we may easily understand his will. If you listen to mother, you can receive rice cake even while you sleep. Also, as you know very well, father wrote, Elisha, follow Elijah. Joshua, follow Moses. Peter, follow Jesus. And I follow mother. I have set you an example, so you should do as I have done today, engraving these words on tablets of our hearts once again. We should all discern between the truth and falsehood. Let's see one more verse in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, in Revelation 19, it says, the Lamb and His Bride. In Revelation 21, it says, the Lamb and the Wife of the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, it says, the Spirit and the Bride. So the Spirit is referring to the Lamb. It is the Lamb who is to come in the age of the Holy Spirit. So it must be the second coming Christ, right? From a spiritual point of view, the second coming Christ is our Father, Father and the Bride. Who is the Bride? Father and mother speak to us. Father and mother lead us. There is no church in this world that can lead us to heaven other than the church where father and mother speak to us, guide us, and call us to come. There is no other truth beside this. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book, after which words that God say, do not add or take away. It was right after giving us the testimony about the Spirit and the Bride who say, come. Nowadays, in which church do the Spirit and the Bride say, come? It is in our church, that is, the Church of God. The Spirit and the Bride appear and give us the water that gives life to mankind, right? In order to lead mankind to life and salvation, God revealed Heavenly Mother as the reality of the New Covenant. He let us know that 
The new covenant is the very covenant by which we can receive the forgiveness of sins. He also proclaimed the new covenant establishing the Passover as the day when we could receive the holy flesh and blood of God. Didn't he? Only when we share the same flesh and blood, we can be part of the same family. Then we are related by blood, aren't we? So our Father awakened us to understand that this relationship is established through the New Covenant and that Heavenly Mother is at the heart of the New Covenant. He left us His teaching, even I will follow Mother. So all of you should follow Mother to the end wherever she goes. Between the insistence that we should only believe in Father and this teaching that we should believe in both God the Father and God the Mother, which one belongs to the true faith and which one belongs to false faith? Believing in both God the Father and God the Mother is the true faith, which can lead us to eternal salvation in the kingdom of heaven, allowing us to become the children of the true God, isn't it? We must follow this path of faith until the very end. If we are indeed living in this age, when we can meet and receive Heavenly Mother, we should not keep this precious teaching of God only to ourselves, but continually share it with all those who do not know. Hoping that we can give many souls around us the opportunity to be saved by preaching in Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. I would like to conclude today's sermon. Thank you very much.